Pacific Glade is a quiet town, mostly. That's one of the perks of living so far away from everyone else. It's the kind of place where you let your kids wander long after the sun goes down. A place where, you, kind of place where you don't mind animals coming out of the forest to nuzzle your heels and beg for scraps. We get next to zero tourism. Some people joke that we should call it the Neverglades. With a blip on the map that you'd never notice unless you were driving through. Old Town could disappear from the face of the earth one day and the rest of the world would never notice our absence. If you spent most of your life here like me, you grow used to its idiosyncrasies. Take the weather. We've had hailstorms in July and hot December nights that make you want to jump headfirst into Lake Lucid. The woods make noises too. The usual hoots and hollers of the, the usual hoots and hollers, of course, but sometimes when it's late, you hear these strange scraping sounds from the trees that make the fillings in your teeth tingle. And let's not forget that summer where every single chicken in the glade vanished overnight. I never found a trace of those critters, not even a single feather left behind. Par for the course for the average citizen, but when you work here as a homicide detective, you notice other things. Bodies with unexplained wounds and markings. Trails that lead nowhere. Pieces that don't quite fit together, no matter how much you turn them. Eventually, you have to accept that not all cases can be solved. Now, that's a shitty feeling. But that's reality for you. Some killers never get caught. Some deaths have no satisfying explanation. You take the good cases with the bad and hope you leave the world at least a little better than you found it. The case that changed everything for me started out not different from all the others. I was driving down the highway in my police cruiser, flipping through the radio stations on the dash, when Olivia Marconi's voice came crackling over my walkie-talkie. You there, Mark? She said. We got a suspicious death at the gas station in Minnow Street. This one's got your department written all over it. I brought the walkie up to my mouth. Be there in a sec, I said. Try and keep the body warm for me. Just get over here, asshole. I could usually tell when Marconi was messing with me, but there was no smirk in her voice this time. It didn't bode well. My smile fading, I stepped on the gas and rocketed down the highway towards the center of town. No matter where you go in the glade, drive far enough and you'll find yourself surrounded by trees, and not just any trees. I'm talking a full-blown forest, with twisted branches and canopies that make everything dark as night even in mid-afternoon. The nearest town is a 20-minute drive through acres of wilderness. I remember growing up and hearing stories from the other kids. The stuff we saw on TV was all propaganda. There was nothing more to the world except an endless forest that branched out in all directions and swallowed up the horizon. Pretty morbid for a bunch of kids. But then again, kids are pretty morbid. I would know. I got two of my own. It was getting late when I finally pulled up to the Minnow Street gas station, and in the darkening treetops, flashed with spirals of red and blue, the lot was absolutely packed with cruisers. Parking further down the street, I stepped out of my car and crossed the lot to slip underneath the police tape. Sheriff Marconi was speaking to a boy in a red cashier's vest when I walked in. He couldn't have been more than 16. His skin was slick with sweat, and he wouldn't stop fidgeting. He just kept wringing his hands together wiping them on the sides of his pants in a constant, agitated motion. When Marconi saw me enter, she placed a hand on the boy's shoulder and said something too quiet for me to hear. She left him alone with his private trauma and came over to join me by the door. Poor kid's scared out of his wits, she said under her breath. I don't blame him. This, this one's a doozy, Mark. They even got a federal agent investigating the case. Seriously? I asked. That was fast. I craned my neck, but the shelves were swarming with cops. I couldn't make out any unfamiliar faces. She shrugged. And uh, must have been somebody in the area already. He got here just a couple minutes after we did. I'll go see what he's up to, I said. Maybe he spotted something our guys have missed. Be my guest, she grimaced. But brace yourself, Mark. It's not pretty over there. I tipped her a quick salute. I worked my way through the aisles, heading towards the scene of the crime. It wasn't hard to find. Cops were streaming in and out over the shelves, ushering curious spectators away and trying to stifle the overall panic from the other customers. I pushed my way through the mob and found myself staring down at a hopelessly mangled body. 
There was something unnatural about the way that he was sprawled out on the floor. Something disjointed, almost a little spidery. I'd recognized the federal agent right away. He would have stood out in any crowd, easily seven feet tall and slender as a pole. He loomed over the cop like a statue. Everything about him was gray, fedora, trench coat, even the pallid color of his skin. The smoldering tip of a cigar protruded from his teeth. He turned to face me as I approached. His eyes were a strange shade of purple that I'd never seen before. They seemed to spin under the overhead lights. Uh, hi, I said, holding out my hand. Detective Mark Hannigan. Nice to meet you. The tall figure stared at my outstretched hand for a few seconds, then shook it. The same to you. His voice had a gravelly quality, like his throat was coated with pebbles. Thin wisps of smoke escaped from his teeth and billowed around the end of his cigar. What should I call you? I asked after a few seconds of silence. For now, Inspector is fine. But don't mind me. What are your thoughts on our friend here? I leaned down and examined the body. The man's face was hanging in flaps. Jagged red streaks that had already begun to fester. The stench was something awful. His nose had disintegrated into a mass of gore and bone. The limbs sprawled across the tiles, bent backwards at impossible angles. In a few places, chunks of blood-stained bone jutted through the skin. I'd seen some pretty grisly stuff on the force before, but this took the cake. Bile turned in my throat, and I withdrew quickly from the body. Do we have an idea on the Vic yet? I asked. His license says Edgar Guerrero. Although it's hard to tell if he's the man in the picture, his face is too disfigured. The inspector knelt down and traced the tiles around the body with one bony finger. He drew it back and rubbed his fingers together. A fine stream of shiny powder trickled to the floor. I frowned. That glass? I think so, he replied. He rose to his feet and brushed the powder off his coat. Look at the way the body slumped. Lacerations. Broken bones. It's almost as though he went straight through a windshield. That's crazy, I said. There's blood everywhere, sure, but no footprints or drag marks. If this was really a car accident, he either staggered in here after the fact or somebody else lugged him here. Maybe, the inspector said. But why go through all the effort? Whoever did this didn't even try to hide the body. He flicked some ash towards the crime scene. The body was splayed out across the tiles, limbs spread wide like a human starfish, blood glistening in puddles under the sickly fluorescent lights. He was messy and gory, awfully suspicious. Whoever did this wanted the body to be found. What is it? Got a warning? I asked. The inspector gazed down thoughtfully at the body. It's possible, of course. That's assuming this was murder. That someone left the body here intentionally. If this was just a freak accident, we've got an entirely different situation on our hands. And that worries me. I'm not sure I follow you, Inspector, I said. But he didn't elaborate. He kept staring down at the body, purple eyes spinning, lost in thought. Shrugging, I took my phone and snapped a few photos, trying to capture the scene from every angle. Marconi and I could get a closer look once I got the pictures back to the headquarters. All the while, the Inspector stood utterly still. If it went for the curls of steamy breath escaping from around a cigar, I might have mistaken him for a statue after all. Marconi was leaning against her cruiser when I left the store. I watched as she pulled a stick of gum from her pocket and brought it up to her mouth like a cigarette. Marconi had quit smoking a month ago, and had taken up chewing gum as a substitute. I almost never saw her without a wad in her mouth. She said it helped her relax, and who was I to judge? I walked over and joined her by the cruiser. What did the kid tell you? She snapped the gum in the back of her cheek. He was shelving some cereal boxes when he heard this loud crumpling sound, like somebody crushing a really big can of soda. He went over to the next aisle to check it out and found our friend Mr. Guerrera just lying there. Says he screamed for a few seconds before running to the bathroom to puke. His story checks out with a few customers that we could talk to about it. That sounds like it happened in a matter of seconds, I said. But how is that possible? Guy looks like he's been in a car crash. Nobody could get that mangled that quickly, let alone in a fucking gas station. Marconi turned her head and stared at the convenience store doors. The inspector just wandered outside, cigarette tips still smoldering. 
He shoved his hands in his trench coat pockets and strode off down the sidewalk. His stride was strange. His body didn't rise and fall with each step, it stayed completely level, as if he was gliding along the ground. I watched the steady glow of his cigar as he turned the corner and disappeared from view. What do you think of that guy? Marconi asked. I only talked to him for a few seconds, but he gave me the creeps. Yeah, he's definitely... something, I said. I craned my neck, but the inspector was long gone. Never seen anybody quite like him. Not a bad detective, though. Marconi gnawed on her gum for a few pensive seconds. Well, I hope he wraps up this case quick, she said. I'll rest easier when the feds are off our backs. She spat the wad back into her hand and folded it into the empty wrapper. I stood back as she opened the cruiser door and hopped into the driver's seat. Before she left, she rolled down the window and gave me the dimmest of smiles. See you back at the station, she said. Then she revved the engine and rolled backwards out of the parking lot. The coroner's office confirmed what we had already expected. The victim's wounds were consistent with that of a car crash. It wasn't the lacerations or the broken bones that had killed him, it was blunt force trauma to the head. That explained the mangled mess of his nose. What it didn't explain was how a car crash victim had ended up sprawled on the floor of a convenience store. The security footage wasn't much help. It showed Edgar Guerrera entering the store and browsing the shelves. But after a few minutes, the camera began to fizzle and grow riddled with static. By the time it came back into focus, Edgar was dead. Sabotage? Had someone messed with the security camera to conceal their involvement in his death? Nothing seemed to make any sense. And trying to find meaning in this case had me working late into the hours of the night. My wife, Ruth, called me a few times to make sure I was okay. I couldn't tell her too much about the case for obvious reasons, but Ruth was perceptive. She'd seen a couple of my cases on the news and she knew how dark these things could get. I promised her I was fine and that I'd be home within the next few hours. She didn't quite sound convinced, but said that she'd leave dinner in the fridge for whenever I got back. My investigation into the life of Edgar Guerrera brought up Zilch. He was working at a car repair workshop down in the Lower Glade, and doubled as a night janitor at Pacific High. He had a wife and two daughters, and went to church with his family on Sundays. I couldn't figure out why anybody would want to kill this guy. He was as vanilla as they come. He had no obvious enemies, no one who harbored enough of a grudge to murder him in such a gory and visible way. Unless the inspector was right and this was somehow a freak accident, which left us where? That line of reasoning made even less sense than the murder theory. By morning, I was a walking headache, and it only gotten worse when news of another dead body came over the police channel. The officer seemed reluctant to describe the details, which could only mean one thing. This was a gory one. I thought back to the mangled mess of Edgar Guerrero's body, and wondered what kind of fresh horror they'd stumbled upon this time. There's no point in putting it off until later. Grabbing my jacket, I headed out the door and climbed into my cruiser. The body had been found on the front porch of a house in the Lower Glade, down by Spokane Falls. A few details I could get over the radio were maddeningly vague. All I gathered was that the victim was young and female. However she had died, it was too gruesome to announce over the airwaves. I stepped on the gas and urged my car to go a little faster. The victim's house was a pretty little number, white fences, low-hanging eaves, a front yard laden with flowers of all colors. The falls crashed like pistons in the background. I drove up the driveway, talked for a bit with the officer on duty, and then got out of my car to investigate the scene. I pulled on a set of latex gloves as I did so. A pair of cops were standing together and muttering to one another by the front porch. They stepped aside, warily to let me through. The porch reeked of rotten body smell, and I had to hold a hand over my mouth and nose before I dared to get any closer. The victim was a blonde-haired girl in her late 20s or so. The entire left side of her body had collapsed into a splattery mess of gore that spread outward in all directions. One green eye still stared blankly into the distance. I knelt down, observing the splintery remains of her limbs for anything out of the ordinary. It was difficult. My eyes were swimming, and I had to fight back the urge to retch. When I looked up again, the inspector was slouched in the doorway. His fedora was pulled low, and his face was framed in a halo of smoke. 
that damn cigar again. It was like an extension of his body. I almost couldn't imagine him without it. Did the Fed send you down here? I asked. They can't possibly think there's a link between these cases, I mean, aside from their sheer weirdness. I go where I'm needed. Right now I'm needed here. Didn't sound like he was going to offer anything more, so I stood up and began peeling off my latex gloves. The officer who got here first said her name was Vivian Tracy. A couple of them actually knew her from around town. She volunteered downtown at the soup kitchen and ran a reading group at the public library. It's bright kid. Her neighbor was the one to phone us about the body. She said she was walking home from the supermarket and just saw Vivian lying there. She didn't get close enough to see the gorier details, but it sounded like she saw enough. The inspector nodded. Do we know anything about the neighbor? Not much. She's getting on in years. She likes walking to the store to get some exercise in her routine. Apparently, she didn't know Vivian all that well, but she said that she seemed like a nice enough girl. Not the kind of person someone would want to murder. Just like Mr. Guerrero, the inspector said quietly. Sounded like he'd done some research of his own. I cast another glance at the body. If this even was murder, I said. I'd seen suicides leap from buildings before. I'd watched medics scrape viscera off the sidewalk. There was no doubt in my mind that Vivian Tracy had fallen to her death, but how was that possible? The porch roof overhead was still intact. She obviously hadn't come crashing through it. And there was no way our would-be murderer could have dragged the body here. The splatter made it all too clear that this was the point of impact. What the hell's going on here? I muttered. The inspector leaned down and tilted what remained of Vivian's arm with one hand. Her skin was streaked with blotchy green patches. It reminded me of the grass stains my son got on their knees after soccer practice. Is this significant? I asked him. Everything's significant, he replied, straightening up. You should know that by now. Steam trailed from his cigar in slow, almost thoughtful spirals. My head was starting to throb again, and the insistent crashing of Spokane Falls wasn't doing much to help. I rubbed my aching temple. It had been a long day and a half. Maybe things would start making sense... If I went home and recharged my batteries. It was around three in the morning when the cell phone on my dresser began to buzz. I've always been in a light sleeper, which is lucky for a detective. You never know when you need to be on your feet in a hurry. I fumbled for the phone and brought it up to my ear. Detective Hannigan, I said, keeping my voice to a whisper. Ruth was fast asleep next to me and I didn't want to wake her up. It's me, said the voice on the other end of the line. The inspector. The connection didn't muffle his voice, which created this unsettling illusion that he was crouching by my bedside, speaking directly into my ear. I rubbed my eyes and peered around the bedroom just to be on the safe side. How'd you get this number? I mumbled. The inspector either didn't hear me or chose not to answer. I've been doing research down at the station and I may have picked up a lead on the Tracy Guerrera deaths. Can you head to the Sokomish Bluff area and do some recon? I squinted at the clock on my desk. I'm officially off-duty, Inspector. Are you sure you can't ask one of the other officers? I'm pretty sure Marconi's out patrolling right now. No, it needs to be you, Mark. Call me when you're on the road, and I'll give you the specifics. Hang on, Inspect. Damn it. The man didn't leave much room for conversation. I stared at the glowing screen on my phone for a few seconds before sighing and placing it down again. Ruth's eyes were open when I turned to get out of bed. They glittered a little in the light from the window. Duty calls? She asked. She drew back the covers a few inches and began to knead the fabric with her right hand. The moon dappled her bare skin with shadows of leafy branches. I leaned over and kissed her gently on the forehead. I won't be gone long. I promise. She surveyed me, silent. Her eyes refusing to give away that she was thinking. Just stay safe, she said at last. I told her I would. And I slipped out of bed. I told her I would, and slipped out of bed, grabbing my jacket from the bedpost and tripping hastily into a pair of work boots. I called the inspector as I headed outside and fumbled through my jacket pockets for the keys to my Camaro. Okay, I'm here, I said. Tell me what you got. 
Both victims had ties to a high school teacher named Elroy Pickett. He replied in that strangely crisp voice. I glanced around again before slipping into the driver's seat. He's a botanist. Teaches environmental science at the school where Edgar did his janitorial work. He's also a head volunteer at the youth group Vivian Tracy attended up until her death. I paused, waiting for more. That's it? I asked. You got me out of bed for a connection this flimsy? I'm sorry, Inspector, but there's nothing to even remotely suggest that this is a lead. People know other people. It's not so unusual for both Vicks to have mutual friends in a town this size. The inspector louted out an exasperated noise that I could only describe as a hiss. <sighs> but that's the thing, he said. They don't have anyone in common. I checked as many sources as I could, and as far as I can tell, Elroy is the only link between our victims, plus Elroy himself seems to have dropped off the radar. He hasn't shown up at school for the past week and nobody has seen him around town since then. He's holed up in his house doing God knows what. That's why I want you to do a little snooping, scope out his home, and see if he's up to anything suspicious. I sighed. Fine, I'll humor you on this one, but you'd better be on to something here. The voice at the other end of the line is quiet for a few moments. I don't know if you believe in intuition, Mark, but every nerve in my body went on edge when that man's name came up on the database. One way or another, he's involved with this, and I intend to find out how. He gave me Elroy's address and hung up before I could get another word in. A real talker, that one. I shook my head, turned the wheel, and headed down the back roads that would take me all the way to Skokomish Bluffs. When I was a kid, the bluffs had a reputation of being haunted. Indian burial grounds and such, you know how it is. But mostly the bluffs were just quiet. We almost never had disturbances this far out of town. The few people who lived out here kept to themselves and so did the animals who poked their heads out of the forest from time to time. This was off near the edge of the glades. We couldn't walk ten feet without stumbling into a line of trees. The view from the top of the bluffs was stunning. During my younger years, I used to come up here with my friends and watch the setting sun sink behind the line of treetops made the entire forest look like it had gone up into flames. I drove through a couple of acres of wilderness before the ground sloped upwards and the trees gave way to a grassy emptiness. The road beneath my tires was more dirt than pavement. From time to time, the occasional house would rise from the landscape and flit past my side window. Most of them had seen better days. Grimy, warped wood that glistened in the moonlight and shutters hanging askew. That sort of stuff. A few lone cattle drifted through the fields, nibbling aimlessly at the grass. It wasn't hard to find Elroy's house. The place was in much better shape than the houses I had seen before, and there was a massive greenhouse sprouting from the back that seemed to teeter on the edge of the bluffs. Hadn't the inspector said Elroy was a botanist? I parked my car in a nearby thicket and cut the engine. My headlights faded. Then I settled back into the driver's seat and waited. What was I waiting for? I had no clue. The likelihood that Elroy would be awake at this hour, let alone doing anything suspicious, was close to nil. But the inspector had been insistent on me coming here, so I figured I owed him the benefit of the doubt. I kicked my feet up on the dashboard and stared at the empty windows, watching for any signs of movement. Around quarter past four, the front door opened suddenly and I froze where I was sitting. An elderly man with feathery white hair came limping onto the front porch. Elroy? He looked older than I had expected. I followed him as he hobbled over to the porch swing and eased into it with a visible wheeze of breath. I sank deeper into my seat and dialed the inspector on my cell phone. Anything? He asked right away. I'm at Elroy's house and he's just walked under the front porch, I said under my breath. A little late for him to be out, don't you think? Especially someone his age. I could practically see the inspector wrinkling his brow. His age? What do you mean? I mean, he's seriously old. Old enough to be my grandfather. I don't know, Inspector. Seems like you might have made the wrong call on this one. There was a sharp intake of breath on the other side of the line. Don't go anywhere near him, the Inspector said. His voice, usually so collected, now bordered on frantic. Shit. Shit. This is bad. You need to get back to the station now. I peered through the front window again. Elroy was drifting lazily on the porch swing. 
hair flowing around his head like wisps of white cotton candy. He's an old man, Inspector. He practically had a heart attack just walking across the porch. How could he possibly be dangerous? That's no old man, the Inspector insisted. Trust me. If that thing gets its hands on you, it's all over. You need to get out of there. Elroy jerked his head up suddenly, as if he could hear the Inspector's voice from all the way across the lawn. His swing froze in place. I tried to crouch behind the dashboard as his eyes darted back and forth. I didn't think you could see my car from here, but those eyes seemed remarkably sharp for someone his age, and I couldn't shake the sense that they could see in the darkness. They reminded me of the time I'd taken a hiking trip with my friends up in Cataman State Forest. We'd seen an actual cougar prowling the rocks on the cliff over from ours. Its eyes glowed yellow in the light from the moon. If it could leap the gap and devour us, I'm sure it would have. And that was a look that I saw in Elroy's eyes. A kind of animalistic hunger. I'll meet you back at the station, I whispered into the phone. Elroy sat there for a few more minutes, peering into the night before he pried himself from the porch swing and shuffled back into the house. I didn't waste any time getting out of there. I started the engines as quickly as I could and I pulled away from the thicket, leaving trails of trampled leaves behind me. Before long, I was out of the bluffs and zooming down the street towards the police station. The trees loomed like sentinels around me, and for the first time in a very long time, I was thankful for cover. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you all thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, or watching tonight's story if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, that means you're probably on the podcast that's available on iTunes, on the Google Play Store, and is now actually available on Spotify and doesn't use as much data. So, hey, that's a thing. If you guys aren't listening on YouTube or Spotify, then I have no idea how else you could have found me. Unless you found one of those books on Amazon. You know, the Creepypasta Collection, Volume 1, Volume 2. Those are things, too. Oh, well. I don't know how you would have heard me there, seeing as this was recorded, like, two years after those came out. Uh. Well, anyway. Thanks for listening, folks. And sweet dreams.